love that show and jazz ladies out there. This is your boy Satchel Hosho, broadcasting live from the cabaret in the sky. And when I'm not busy doing my soloing on my two horn, I just tune in to the Olivist Visits. We all be news and radio. Oh, yeah. Learning Theory Moments in Black History is brought to you by the good folks at We All Be News Radio and TV. Learning Theory Moments in Black History. A Satchmo story. Louis Armstrong, also known as Satchmo, is considered by many the true king of jazz, an ambassador of American culture who is recognized worldwide as an icon in art and entertainment. Learning Theory Moments in Black History will show the rise of Louis Armstrong via transformational learning theory. We will present several relationships that were key or pivotal in shaping the legend and the true American original genius known as Louis Saxmo Armstrong. Please join us for this very edutaining and enlightening story. She said, Louie, that gator just as scared of you as you are of him. Then I looked back at my mom and said, Mom, if that gator is just as scared of me as I am of him, then that water ain't fit to drink. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. tell you something. Uh, I had a lot of transformational learning experiences coming up in New Orleans, way back in town, see. When I was a little youngster, a little, little lad, short pants and whatnot, I worked for this family called the Konoskis. 
Kanaskis were some Russian Jewish immigrants. But boy, they taught me everything about work ethic, and about family, and about love, and about not just love, but unconditional love and support. You see, that it was the Kanaskis, one of the first people I knew of that encouraged me on my path to music greatness, you understand? Uh, I used to work for the Kanaski brothers. And what we used to do was, we used to uh, run a junk wagon. No, Jane Allen, way back in town, see collecting junk and all that stuff. And also, another hustle we used to do, we used to sell coal, coal on the red light district. You know the red light district, where a lot of people, uh, they be streetwalking and stuff like that. You know I understand? Streetwalking, hustling, fishing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We used to sell coal to the people that worked there, the employees and whatnot. To make sure they stay warm when it was cold outside, you know what I mean? Uh, real toasted like. But anyway, it was Konoskis, they encouraged me. My love and son. I mean, Mother Konoskis used to sing to me uh, Russian lullaby. And, and it was uh, some, one of my first songs I learned on my tin horn that I got. And contrary to popular belief, I was able to get my first cornet because I worked for the Konoskis. You see, uh, one of the Konoski brothers gave me a, a $2 advance, and I used to save 50 cents every week until I got $5 to buy the horn I saw in the window. So it really encouraged me. One of the first things I learned on my horn was, of course, Home Sweet Home and the Russian Lullaby. And I'd like to sing this for you, the Russian Lullaby, because it's, it's a song dear to my heart. Matter of fact, some of my best friends were Jewish friends, including my manager and my doctor who saved my life back in 69. And Lucille always made sure I had my muscle balls, because one thing the Konofskis loved to do for me was make sure they fed me, you know, because sometimes we worked late at night, and then by the time I get home, we too late to eat anything. And say, well, I love it. You work so hard for us. You're part of our family. Why not? Spend some time to eat with us. I said, oh, okay, so I eat muscle balls to this day. Lucille keeps them in my refrigerator for me and me at my home in Queens. But anyway, here's, here's the rest of my life. Every night you hear me croon a Russian lullaby. Just a little plaintive tune when baby starts to cry. Rock about my baby somewhere they may be. Yeah, that's so sweet. A land that's free for you and me and a Russian lullaby. Short kid, still. I got a got a cap gun for my for my for my stepfather. You see, and I shot out in the air. I said, bang, 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 about six times, right? And when I landed in the joint, uh, the colorway homes for boys. You see, 
I was a bad kid. I want people to think, oh, Lord, he a bad old kid. One of them bad kids from way back in town. You know? One of them little rascals, a dirty rascal here. You know? But anyway, I was lucky to meet a man named Peter Davis, who was the orchestra band leader of the Colorway Home for Boys. He used to think I was one of them bad kids until he gave me a cornet and the rest is, as I they say, history. He really took a liking to me. He was like a father figure. You know, he used to take me home on his off days and, you know, his wife used to feel me on great big captains of red beans and rice. I love red beans and rice, boy. It's a New Orleans street there, red beans and rice. You understand? So he used to feed me and he also used to teach me food for thought, music knowledge, theory, things of that nature. So I, I was one of the star players, and it really meant a lot to me to know that a person, uh, when they see you got talent and potential, that they are willing to help you out to reach that talent and potential. And I never forgot, I never forgot Mr. Peter Davis, one of the grandest supporters of personal hell coming through on this journey known as life. Yeah, da, da, di, da, da, da. Oh, yeah. So I, I spent time looking for mentors one night. Now, I was in a singing, singing boys group of vocal a quartet, singing on the corners, one of the most popular things going on in New Orleans, you know, on the black hand side, you understand? But I needed a mentor. Every time I went to, to players like Freddie Kepler, King Freddie Kepler, Buck Johnson, people like that, they'll show me a little bit, but somebody they didn't show me nothing at all. So I said, man, I really want to learn my horn. Who can teach me how to become a great musician? So I was blessed to run into Papa Joe King Oliver. To me, King Oliver, he's the beginning and he's the end, man. One of the greatest trumpet players to ever come out of New Orleans. You understand? My greatest mentor. When I tell people all the time, when you hear Lewis play, you're hearing echoes of King Oliver. He was one of the true, the great ones, one of the trumpet kings. But he was really the trumpet king that showed me how to be a king on my trumpet. You understand? He treated me like I was his own son. He's taking me home, and his wife fed me them, them lovely buckets and bowls full of red beans and rice. Oh, yeah, daddy, I remember no time. Red beans and rice. Woo. That could start a lot of peace in the world. Everybody eat red beans and rice, you understand? No more wars. Everybody be eating the red beans and rice. <laughs> but anyway, a Papa Joe treated me like I was his own son. He had no kids, but I feel like I was his doctor's son. So I just called him Pops. I said, hey, Pops, how you doing today? He said, hey, Louis. You know, but he had a bad eye, but you know, when I be patrolling out here on one eye, looking like this. Hey, Louis, where are you going, boy? You want to you play some drama today? You want to be a gig? I said, yeah, yeah, Pops, I want to do a gig. Then he take me on his gig to sit in for him. Sometimes you substitute for Joe Oliver when you couldn't make a gig. And I feel like, man, I'm becoming a real musician there, as they call it down New Orleans. A real musician there, because the Papa Joe King Oliver. 
It was Papa Joe came off, I don't know. I'll be sent talk to you today. Matter of fact, I don't know. There'll be a Louis Armstrong around, Papa Joe King Oliver. Like I said, he's the beginning and the end for me. But you hear Louis Armstrong play, you hear the echoes of Oliver. Can you dig it, Daddy? Oh, yeah. <laughs>